Good evening and welcome to Calvary Baptist Church in Hollister. We're so honored to have you with us tonight. Hey, listen, if you're joining us for the first time, you've just found our ministry on sermonaudio.com or through Twitter, uh, welcome. We're honored to have you with us. Uh, please, uh, if you've not already, subscribe and get alerts to when uh, we go live. So we thank you uh, for doing that in advance. We're in a series on Sunday night. We're going to come to the end of it uh, within a couple of weeks. But tonight we're in Mark chapter 15. So I'll give you a moment to turn there. Uh, the series has been titled, Jesus Christ, the Servant of Humanity. Uh, tonight we're going to look in chapter 15 at the death and burial of the servant. And so let's go ahead and we'll read Mark chapter 15, uh, verses 1 through 6 to start with. And straightway in the morning the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council and bound Jesus and carried him away and delivered him to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, Art thou the king of the Jews? And he answering said unto him, Thou sayest it. And the chief priest accused him of many things, but he answered nothing. And Pilate asked him again, saying, Answerest thou nothing? Behold, how many things they say against thee. But Jesus yet answered uh, nothing, so Pilate marveled. Now at the feast he released unto them one prisoner, whomsoever they desired. Well, in this particular chapter tonight, we'll see the death or the crucifixion of the servant and his burial. And uh, just a very simple uh, proposition that we want to uh, bring before you tonight. And um, that is here uh, to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, if you'll jump ahead with me down to verse 39, we'll see that this is part of the testimony of the Roman centurion and his observation of what took place at the crucifixion. He says in verse 39, And when the centurion which stood over against him saw that he so cried out and gave up the ghost, he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. And so this is our very simple proposition tonight, um, to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So let's look here tonight. We have uh, five or six points that we just want to go through. Verses 1 through 6, uh, we see the silence of the servant at his crucifixion and how they were marveling that uh, he said nothing, that Pilate was uh, just totally amazed. You know, if you'll also just take your Bibles and turn over to Isaiah chapter 53 tonight and uh, put a, a marker there. So we're going to be flipping back and forth between Isaiah 53 and uh, Mark chapter 15 and um, looking at some of the verses that are in Isaiah 53 and how they are fulfilled here in Mark chapter 15. And one verse in particular is definitely quoted. But in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 7, it says, He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. So this is where we get this idea of the silence of the servant at his crucifixion. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is silent, uh, so he opened not his mouth. Now, the Gospel of John and the Apostle John give us the most detail about the, uh, the tri trial in front of Pilate, the Roman trial, if you will. And when you combine the Gospel records, you'll discover that Pilate repeatedly uh, stated that he believed in the innocence of Jesus Christ. He found no fault in Jesus. So you can consult the Gospel of John, chapter 18, verse 38 on that. Uh, chapter 19 and verse 4. You can also look at Luke 23, 14 and 23, 22. So Pilate's problem was not that he um, believed that Jesus was guilty or not. He, he didn't wrestle with that. He just lacked the moral courage to stand for what he believed. He wanted to avoid a riot in Matthew chapter 27, verse 24. So he was willing to go along with the people to content them, to quiet them down. And Pilate did not ask, is it right? Instead, he asked, is it safe? Is it popular? You know, silence many times is the best answer to criticism. A uh, metropolitan uh, violinist was one time offered space in the New York Herald to answer his detractors. And this is what he said. I think it's best if they write against me and I play 
against them. Uh, you know, that's a, a very fitting answer. Just go about and do what you need to do and uh, be quiet. Uh, even the Proverbs tells us that if a foolish man would hold his tongue, he's going to be considered wise. Listen to this, Proverbs 17, 28. Even a fool, when he holdeth his peace, is counted wise, and he that shutteth his lips is an esteemed man of understanding. And so sometimes it's just best to remain quiet and to be a person of few words. And so the Lord Jesus Christ, being an innocent man, did not have to defend himself and he remained silent against all the baseless accusations that were brought against him. Well, our second point tonight here is the um, substitution of the servant at his crucifixion, verses 7 through 14. So in Mark chapter 15, verses 7 through 14. And there was one named Barabbas, which lay bound with them that had made insurrection with him, who had committed murder in the insurrection. And the multitude crying aloud began to desire him to do as he had ever done unto them. In other words, they're asking Pilate to keep this tradition going. But Pilate answered them saying, Will ye that I release unto you uh, the king of the Jews? For he knew that the chief priests had delivered him uh, for envy. But the chief priests moved the people uh, that he should rather release Barabbas unto them. And Pilate answered and said again unto them, What will ye that I should do unto him whom ye call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him, crucify him. Then Pilate said unto them, Why? What evil has he done? And they cried out the more exceedingly, Crucify him. And so Pilate, willing to content the people, released Barabbas unto them and delivered Jesus when he had scourged him to be crucified. So we see the, the substitution of the servant at his crucifixion. Now, you might think that um, Barabbas in some way is a substitution, but no, definitely not. Jesus Christ is uh, taking Barabbas's place and going in place of that. And Barabbas is just a, if you will, a metaphor for us as sinners that Jesus Christ goes to take our place. Uh, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5 21 that God the Father uh, made him, that's Jesus Christ, uh, who knew no sin to become sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God through him. And so what a wonderful picture of the substitutionary work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we all have committed the, the sins against God and uh, the wrath of God is poured out upon us. Now, this is even prophesied if you're going to flip back to Isaiah chapter 53 in verse 12. It says, Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great. He shall divide the spoil with the strong. Why? Because he poured out a soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Oh, what a wonderful thing, the substitutionary death of the servant. And that's definitely Jesus Christ in Isaiah chapter 53. So Pilate thought he could avoid making a decision, so try to get it out of his hands. He sent him over to Herod. Uh, Herod only sent Jesus back to Pilate after mocking him. Uh, then the governor offered the people a choice, Jesus the Nazarene or Barabbas, the murderer and the insurrectionist thinking that surely sanity would prevail. They would ask Jesus to be released. But the chief priests had prepared the people carefully to cry out uh, to crucify Jesus and to release Barabbas and set them free. You know, uh, another story that illustrates this concept of substitution is the story, A Tale of Two Cities, once again, by Charles Dickens. Uh, many of the critics who evaluate that book see spiritual themes being communicated through the story. Here's one of the quotes from a critic. The most important resurrections in the novel are those of uh, Charles Darnay. First, Sidney Carton's resemblance to him saves him from being convicted and executed in England. And then the same resemblance allows the latter to switch places with him in the concierge in uh, Paris, And so these are surrounded with uh, heavily religious language that compare Carton's sacrifice of his own life for other sins to Christ's sacrifice 
on the cross. And so you remember that, that switch that takes place in the novel. And in, if you've watched the movie, you see it there too. But the Lord Jesus Christ switched place with us, that he became sin for us, even though he did not know sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So he becomes our substitute. He becomes our righteousness and our full payment that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. So what a beautiful teaching in the substitutionary death of the Lord Jesus Christ. We see that in verses 7 through 14. Our third point tonight is found in verses 15 through 23, and this is the scourging of the servant. So we saw at the end of verse 15 that uh, Jesus was delivered to be scourged before he was to be crucified. So verse 16, it says, And the soldiers led him away into the hall called the Praetorium, and they called together the whole band, and they clothed him with purple and a plaited a, a crown of thorns and put it about his head. And he began to salute him and hail uh, him as king of the Jews. And they smote him on the head with a reed and did spit upon him, and bowing their knee, they worshipped him. Now that's obviously mocking worship. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple from him and put on his clothes on him and led him out to crucify him. And they compel one Simon, a Cyrenian, who passed by coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross, and they bring him unto the place called Golgotha, um, which is being interpreted the place of a skull. And so in the Latin, uh, we get uh, Calvary out of that, the place of the skull. And they gave him to drink wine mingled with myrrh, but he received it not. So the scourging of the servant. So if you go to Israel today, you go to the city of Jerusalem, one of the sites that they take you to is uh, the bottom of that ancient fortress where uh, there's inscriptions in the ground of a game that the Roman soldiers played uh, around the time of year that they worship their god Saturn. And what they would do, uh, they would just take a criminal and they would enact uh, out their worship of their god Saturn by... Uh, plating a crown of thorns and, and putting a robe on that prisoner and torturing them. So they had just gone through that festival uh, before uh, the Passover, and so this was fresh in their mind. The, the game is even carved in the pavement there. And uh, so they reenacted that on Jesus and were mocking him and uh, doing this. Now, part of what is taking place here is uh, when they divide his garments out among him, his garments were... Uh, saturated with the uh, alabaster flask uh, of uh, myrrh. And so his garments were very valuable and very costly. And so that's why they divided those in pieces. But they scourged the servant. Um, here's what Isaiah chapter 53 verse 5 says. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. Have you ever noticed the matzah cracker? How uh, it's without leaven, there's no yeast in it, and so that's Christ without sin. Uh, but that it's also bruised and it's a little bit burned, um, and then it's perforated, and the perforation, the, the piercing, uh, laid out in rows or stripes. And then that matzah cracker is broken, and so the body of the Lord Jesus Christ was broken. So there's a wonderful picture of the gospel even right there in the matzah cracker. And uh, notice the substitutionary work again. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, our moral failures, and the chastisement that we were deserving of. Uh, instead, we receive peace because he took that chastisement and we receive healing in place. And so the, surgeon, uh, the servant was scourged uh, beyond recognition, his visage was marred uh, beyond what people could understand. And so the Pilate thought that having Jesus scourged would um, incite the people to compassion once they saw the suffering prisoner, that they would have pity. But according to John chapter 19, the plan did not work. The governor gave in and delivered Jesus to be crucified. You know, truth not political expediency will set an individual free uh, and set oneself free. If we will be a nation of laws and not a nation of personalities, we'll be a much happier people. I think what is uh, being demonstrated during this time of pressure upon our former government 
is that we see certain individuals want to be predominant personality instead of following laws. They want to be a, a very strong and forthright leader, but and they will ignore the laws that they as a leader are supposed to be following. And so they follow the, um, their own personalities and not laws. Um, they disgracefully mocked uh, the Lord Jesus, having beat him and spat upon him, and then uh, worshipped him in mock homage. And so they would laugh at a Jew who claimed to be a king. And even the Jewish people uh, cried out, We have no king but Caesar, John chapter 19, verses 12 through 15. So the Lord Jesus suffered quietly. He did not fight back. And what an example for us as Christians when we also suffer. You realize that in many nations of the world, North Korea, uh, India, uh, Indonesia, uh, many other countries, Iran, uh, Christians are persecuted. Christians suffer for their faith. And so be comforted tonight that the Lord will watch over you and uh, you can follow his example. Now, our fourth point tonight here is found in verses 24 through 32, and that is the superscription of the servant at his crucifixion, the superscription of the servant. So let's go ahead and read uh, verses 24 through 32. And when they had crucified him, they parted his garments, casting lots upon them, what every man should take. And it was the third hour that they crucified him. And the superscription of the accusation was written over him was the king of the Jews. And with him they crucified two thieves, the one on his right hand and the other on his left. And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And they that passed by railed on him, wagging their heads and saying, Ha, ah, thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself and come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests mocking said amongst themselves with the scribes, He saved others himself, he cannot save. Let Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross that we may see and believe. And they that were crucified with him reviled him. Now, this is the fulfillment of Isaiah 53, uh, verse 12. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great. He will divide the spoil with the strong because he has poured out his soul unto death. He was numbered with the transgressors. He bore the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors. And so here's a great high priestly work, making intercession, uh, bearing sins. Um, but notice the identification as well, uh, that he was numbered with the transgressors. He uh, took upon himself our sins in his body, and uh, he identified with us. You know, the superscription identifies him as the legitimate king of Israel but also is a validation of his innocence and the fact that he is truly the Messiah of Israel. You know, the council only had one capital crime that they might be able to present to Pilate, and that was that Jesus claimed to be the king, and uh, he stirred up the people. And so when the high priest asked him if he was the Christ, he said, Yes, I am, and you'll see the Son of Man coming in the clouds and sitting at the right hand of the Father. And that was Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. And so that was the only thing that they had. Now they tried to pass him off as a dangerous revolutionary and insurrectionist that was going to undermine the authority of Rome. And that may have scared Pilate. Now the specific hours, the third hour, the sixth hour, and the ninth hour that are mentioned here. Um, so these are found here in this chapter. Um, from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. is how Jews uh, kept time. So the third hour was 9 a.m., um, the sixth hour was noon, and the ninth hour was 3 p.m. And so Mark followed the Jewish system of keeping time. So this is, he's crucified and he dies by 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So we're going to see um, some miraculous events take place here at the crucifixion of the servant and his death. But... Uh, he truly is the king, and he died for his people. Uh, he bare the transgression uh, for many, the sin of many. And so not only for the sins of Israel, but 
he is a propitiation not only for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. Now, our fifth point tonight here is found in verses 33 through 41. And I told you we had a lot of points, and we're going to go through them quickly tonight. But um, so we see the saying then of the servant at his crucifixion, verses 33 through 41. And when the sixth hour was come, that was noon, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, until three. So here is a miracle. It's uh, high noon, sun shining at its brightest, but yet it's completely black. Now this word, seeing this through Jewish eyes, this would remind the Jewish people uh, of Passover. Uh, when the lamb was spilt, the, the death angel passed over. It was the night, it was darkness. And so the Lamb of God goes to the cross and it becomes completely dark, uh, reminding the people that the weight of sin is coming upon uh, their, their servant, their servant suffering king, their Messiah. So let's look at what he says in verses 33 through 41. But now in verse 34, at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, uh, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani which is being interpreted, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And some of them that stood by when they heard it said, um, behold, he calleth for Elias. And one ran and filled a sponge full of vinegar and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink saying, let alone, let us see whether Elias will come to take him down. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. And the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And so let's go ahead and read down to verse 41. And when the centurion saw that which stood over against him, saw that he so cried out, he gave up the ghost. He said, truly, this man was the son of God. There were also women looking on afar off, among whom was Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and the less, and of Joseph and Salome, who also, when he was in Galilee, followed him and ministered unto him and many other women which came up with him unto Jerusalem. Now, what we want to concentrate upon here is what the Savior said. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? There is some divine mystery in this that we do not understand. How can God the Father uh, use such language? And how can God the Son use such language as to be forsaken? What does this word forsaken mean? Uh, what does it mean? Well, um, I'm just going to read this to you, um, that it means to leave down. The idea being that of deserting someone uh, to a set of circumstances that are against him. To let one down, to desert, to abandon, to leave in the lurch, to leave one helpless. And so... What's the divine mystery? What does this ultimately mean? I don't believe that it means that God the Father was displeased with the Son. No, not at all. Um, in fact, uh, the Father is always pleased with the Son and was pleased with the, the substitutionary work that Jesus was doing on the cross. Um, but he cried out that his Father had forsaken him. Uh, I'll let you try to figure all that out. You can do some of your own research. But here's at a minimum, I believe, what this means. That Jesus Christ felt the weight of our sin upon him. The darkness symbolizing the judgment Jesus experienced when the Father forsook him. Um, that this um, is the deepest suffering that Jesus could have. You know, we're not able to enter into the fullness of this moment. We cannot uh, understand the desolation that Jesus is experiencing, that the Father would regard him to be sin, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. And so he didn't cease to be the Son of God. That would be absolutely impossible. And so um, it wasn't only just a physical darkness. It was a spiritual darkness as the people that stood by mocked and ridiculed him saying, well, he can't even save uh, himself. He can't even come down off the cross and he did all these wonderful miracles, but now look what he can't do. Uh, well, that's because he willingly stayed there. We sing a song in Christianity called, he could have called 10,000 angels, but he died for you and me. There were seven sayings on the cross. Uh, 
that the Lord Jesus uh, said that day. We'll not go into those. But this is the most remarkable of those statements. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The simple answer is the Son of God was forsaken because he was bearing our sin upon himself. We must tonight come to believe like the centurion that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Uh, there was a man from Ethiopia, Africa that was visiting Jerusalem and he had picked up a copy of Isaiah and he was reading the 53rd chapter and he did not understand it and Philip the evangelist joined himself and said do you understand what you're reading and he says no please uh, show me and uh, he said but now who is this man speaking is Isaiah speaking of himself or some other man and Philip began to share with him Jesus and he said look as they traveled down the road here's water what would keep me from being baptized Philip said, well, if you believe, you may. And he answered back, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And then Philip said, well, then let's baptize you. So belief always precedes baptism, believer's baptism. Um, the blood before the water. And so this is the remarkable thing uh, here that Jesus Christ uh, became sin for us. We must believe that he is the Son of God. And so what a thrilling witness uh, here that the Roman centurion is. Um, do you realize that his words could have gotten him into trouble, uh, both with the Jews and the Romans? Jesus Christ is the Son of God. This is one of Mark's important themes. Uh, Mark carries this through. Mark chapter 1, verse 1. Mark chapter 1, verse 11. Chapter 3, verse 11. Chapter 5, chapter 9, chapter 14. Um, and so this is making the fact that he is the son of God. This makes his servanthood and is willing to, to be a servant, to die on the cross, even more remarkable. And then men, let me challenge you here. Uh, notice the women are immortalized in scripture for their faithfulness in staying with Jesus, even through the crucifixion. Where were the disciples? Only John was there. The others left. So let's praise God for the faithful spiritual women of a local church, a Christian husband. Thank God for a spiritual wife um, and her reception, her understanding of who the Lord Jesus Christ is. And so these faithful women were at the cross on that Friday. They were the first to the tomb on Sunday. And so what a contrast to the disciples who boasted that they would die for him. So we owe much as a church to the sacrifice and devotion of believing Christian women. Well, in closing tonight, let's look here at point number six. Let's look at the sepulcher of the servant after his crucifixion, verses 42 through 47. And now when the even was come because it was the preparation, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, an honorable counselor, which also waited for the kingdom of God, came and went in boldly unto Pilate and uh, craved the body of Jesus. And Pilate marveled if he were already dead, and calling unto him the centurion, he asked him whether he had been dead any while. And when they knew of it uh, by the centurion, he gave the body to Joseph. And he bought fine linen and took him down and wrapped him in the linen and laid him in a sepulcher which was hewn out of a rock and rolled a stone upon the door of the sepulcher. And Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph beheld where he was laid. And so um, Isaiah chapter 53 verse 9, And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence, neither was there any deceit in his mouth. And so Isaiah uh, correctly prophesied that the suffering servant would be buried with the rich. And Joseph of Arimathea was a wealthy man who uh, had carved out this tomb. And uh, the Lord is in this tomb. Now, he was also a member of the Sanhedrin, but uh, he was one who was looking for the kingdom of God, uh, one who believed that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, that he was the Messiah. And uh, he had prepared this, and he was assisted by Nicodemus, who was also uh, a member of the council. And so it is possible, by the way, if you don't understand this, to believe in Jesus as the Messiah, that is, to be a Christian and a Jew at the same time, that there's no uh, 
problem in that at all. There, there's no uh, betrayal of Jewishness by believing in the Lord Jesus. And so you have an example of these two men, Joseph of Marathia and Nicodemus, uh, two of the 70 that were ruling Israel at the time. And so he is placed in this tomb. And, um, you know, Nicodemus was the secret disciple um, who came by night. And Jesus said, Nicodemus, you must be born again. And I believe that he came to that place where he realized that Jesus Christ, uh, the teacher of Israel, was the Son of God. He was the Messiah. Now, Joseph comes and he asks for permission for the body of Jesus. And um, so the official uh, release was given, and, uh, but they acted boldly. And uh, his body could have been thrown in the trash, but instead uh, it was dignified here and fulfilled prophetic scripture. And so it was important that his body be prepared for burial so that the empty grave clothes could be left behind in the tomb as a witness to the resurrection. And we'll see that next week in Mark chapter 16. But uh, the way in which he was buried fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah 53 verse 9. And so the fact that he was buried is proof that Jesus actually died on the cross. And the Roman officials would not have released the body without proof that Jesus was dead. Well, tonight I trust that you will believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that you will believe on him at this Christmas season by acknowledging that you're a sinner and you cannot save yourself. Uh, eternal life is a free gift. Uh, the gift of God is eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. But you must repent of your sin. That means to abandon, to turn away from whatever you've been trusting in, yourself, your good works, another God, uh, and put your exclusive trust in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ alone. Worship no other gods, uh, only the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, who, by the way, is the same as the Father and the Spirit. It's just one God. And um, so believe on him tonight. And then call upon him, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. With the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So yes, you need to pray. You need to pray to Jesus, and he will save you. Well, let's close tonight with a benediction um, taken from Numbers chapter uh, 6, verses 24 through 26. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and to be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace.